Good afternoon. That's me up there. Um, I have some of my students in the audience here, and this is how they've experienced me over the last year, kind of like on Zoom. I promise you I'm wearing shoes and trousers. I'm going to talk about um, one concept, which is um, coherent disruption. For some of you, this might seem like common sense, but it's not common practice, at least not in my experience over the last 10 years in the luxury sector. I'm going to make just one point, because like you, uh, my brain is full, and, uh, but I'll make that point many, many times over, uh, so that you can say it at least uh, took one thing away from Nader's talk. So I'm going to start with uh, some advertising. Um, here is Roger Federer. The ad's a bit old, but he's ageless, both on court and off. Um, he's the king of the court, and of course Rolex is the king of the watches, so there's some connection here. But he's also kind of set the norm for advertising in this sector. So uh, we have an endorser, a product, always set at 10.10. I don't know if you ever wondered about that. Um, and the brand name as well. And you can hire Roger. Uh, you can hire George Clooney, my idol. Um, you can hire DiCaprio and others, both locally and in China, um, and every watchmaker follows the same. Now, it's not all their advertisement looks the same, but I wonder who pays these agencies and uh, <laughs> why um, this is seen as a creative industry. <laughs> it's a bit paint by numbers. So um, here's a saying from Malcolm Mulridge, only dead fish swim with the sea. When you have that sequence of ads, all you're saying is, I have a watch. And the consumer is not going to remember your watch. They're going to remember watches and probably think of, oh, Rolex. That's a big watch. And they'll probably think of Roger Federer. Um, so why not do something different? OK, so here's Hublot. Um, and they did this ad a few years ago. And, and this is, um, you know, he was, um, Bernie was, was mugged on a London street. He sent this photograph, his mugshot, at the police station when they took it to um, Jean-Claude Biver, who was the head of Hublot at the time. And um, it says in the tagline, look at what people will do to get their hands on an Hublot. <laughs> now, it's not just disruptive. It's not just different, but it goes to the core of the brand DNA, of what the brand is actually about. And Hublot has a very simple DNA. It's one word. It's fusion. And they're trying to marry the unexpected. Um, as a brand. So it's the art of fusion. You'll see their tagline um, over time. And it goes back to the Big Bang, which was kind of, it really revitalized the brand uh, when they put together rubber and gold. Rubber being completely unexpected for a luxury watch. And they put these two things together. They called it the Big Bang because before that, rubber and gold, that's when they were together before the Big Bang. And then they went their separate ways. Um, and only Hublot brought them back together. And of course, they use this every year, a limited edition with tweed, with lace, whatever it might be. But it really is about marrying kind of the unconventional, the unexpected uh, with luxury and, and the finest craftsmanship and quality. And so they also went to football. They didn't take Roger Federer, who's a great player, but he's extremely boring, at least in my book. They went with Maradona, who is a bit mad. Um, and um, at least, you know, you'd see him on the sidelines wearing his Hublot watch uh, going a bit crazy. They went for football, which is definitely not luxury. But it's also a space they could then own. Um, and, you know, they, every year they have something different with a tattoo artist, uh, Song Bleu, here. So every year they do something different, and it's a theme they can kind of riff on um, over time. As said, only dead fish swim with the sea. So let's look at another category. I know I have some of you in the room here. Um, whiskies. Really? I mean, these are all beautiful products, and I think we have this fascination with our craft um, in the industry, whether it's whiskey, other products, watches, fashion. It's not just the craft. That's the basis. It's almost a hygiene factor. You have to do something with it, stand for something, and many of us will not read the fine print, most of which is about how to pronounce these names. And of course, we use it for single malts, we use it for blended whiskeys, American, Japanese. It's kind of the same format over and over again. But some brands stand out, right? Arbeg has won the best whiskey of the year about six times. But they do things differently. Now, again, it's not just being different, but it 
reflects and is inspired by their DNA. So their DNA is the untamed spirit of Islay. That's kind of the tagline that encompasses it all, and you'll see it on their website. They say it, um, they don't hide it. It inspires them, and hopefully it'll inspire you as well. So they will take a chopper and ride it across America, and you'll see sales go up as they go from bar to bar. And they'll stay up once they've left. Um, you've got the Arbic community. They tattoo themselves. That's how fiercely loyal they are to the brand. Okay? And that's really the question. Do you want to be a product? a fabulous product, or do you want to be a brand? And there is a difference, and the DNA is at the core of what the brand is about. Only dead fish swim with the sea. Now you might say, well, these are watches and whiskey, it's targeted at men, and we're a bit simple. Surely for women, this is different. Not really. Okay, it basically says, we have mascara. Okay. Can you tell me why these particular endorsers are married with each of the brands? I don't think so. And probably the people at the brand cannot either. So it doesn't really reflect on the brand. Um, now here's a brand, many of you will know, um, Benefit Cosmetics. They do things a bit differently. They're real. This is Honest Leah. They always have a certain character for each of their products. And by the way, they're real. It's the eyelashes um, that they're talking about here. But their brand is all about laughter is the best cosmetic. And they put their brand film out where they actually show their brand DNA. And I've given you, if you want to watch this, um, uh, it'll be up on the Walpole website. Uh, you can go and look at their brand film. And they actually walk you through their brand DNA. They're proud of it because what the fun is, is they express it in so many different ways. And each of these strands of their DNA, the laughter and fun, the duality of bold and girly, the creative packaging, the San Francisco scene where the place is so important, the Castro district, uh, which really adds that color and life to the brand. Um, it's how they combine it and how they inspire all their ideas around the product, the advertisements, the events, everything is different in the way this brand does it. And I put this up there for you. This is my all-time favorite. This is Sarah Colonia. She's a comedian. She's on the street. She's the beauty cop, uh, the beauty bust. Um, you can watch this in your own time. Um, let's move on. Perfumes. Really? Some of you are probably in this room. Okay? So either you own a, a certain meaningful space in somebody's mind, or you just advertise over and over again. You have to throw money at it if you're going to go this route. Okay? Or you do things differently. And I often see the brands that are best at doing this, like Ardbeg or Kenzo, they don't have the big budgets to do so. So they're forced to do something different because they cannot outspend their competitors. So they invest in this. If you haven't seen this, it's a viral video online with Margaret Qualley. It's absolutely fabulous. And it's crazy. She is at one of these conferences and probably like you, it's a bit much. And she goes outside and walks around the hotel and does this crazy dance. Okay? Well, it's different, but it's also expressing the brand, which is all about this positive energy. It's this contagious freedom. It's exuberance. It's daring and borderless. Always Paris. It's optimism and impertinence. So here is Karl Lagerfeld. Uh, he was born in Hamburg, Germany, 1933, a bit earlier than I was born in Hamburg, Germany. Uh, that's where I'm from. And he has this line, he says, I, I like the idea of craziness with discipline. And that's really this thought behind coherent disruption. So if you think about this, there's actually two underlying tensions with each, each of them. So there's a tension within craziness, and there's a tension within discipline, and there's a tension between them. So coherence is kind of like this concept of discipline. You want to be coherent with your brand's DNA, but you can't be predictable because you'll be boring if you are. And disruption is about being disruptive with the category, but you must be recognizable with the category. You can't stand out. Remember Crystal Pepsi? It just didn't belong into the Coca-Cola category. So people didn't, they couldn't get their head around it. So it's very difficult to do both at once. So let's go back and let's go a little bit deeper on some of these. Again, here's the jewelry category. Now again, some of you are in the room here. Um, this is not the only thing you do, but I see a lot of this. This didn't take me too long on Google image search where I pulled together these images. They're all the same. 
that women even look the same. They're probably wearing the same dress. Okay, only the jewelry is different. Okay, and I even put Bulgari in there because it's the brand I'm gonna go a little bit deeper on. Um, so even they do it. So here is uh, Jean-Christophe Babin, he's the CEO of uh, Bulgari. And he says, Bulgari would not have been successful without the Roman environment, the Roman warmth, the lifestyle of Roma. It's very much about Rome, not Italy. So we heard earlier today, we talked about Britishness. What does that even mean? Is it different if you're from London? If you're from Islay, like Ardbeg is? Are you from England, right? Really think about what that place is. And it's not just the place, it's also the era. This is not Rome 7,000 years ago. This is Rome at a very particular point in time. That's where the brand was reborn. And that time, was La Dolce Vita. So this movie came out by Fellini in 1960. That's the moment Bulgari was born, in that phase, the Hollywood on, on the Tiber. And it was when Italy, which was a bit of a struggling country, was reborn to be this glamorous place of, of movies and art and history, and, and Italy became proud. But it's not Italy, it's Rome. And this is the brand DNA uh, for Bulgari. And they will always remind themselves of this. So. It's also the time when they had Marina uh, Bulgari, who then formed her own uh, brand. She invented this sense of color, and it came out of a time of crisis, which was World War II, when there was a shortage of materials. They went with semi-precious stones, unfaceted stones, bold cuts that really bring their color to life. Before that, it was all Parisian Me Too Art Deco that drove the brand design and high jewelry, and they broke away from that. From being followers, they became leaders. And you'll see many brands trying to own color today, uh, but Bulgari, it's theirs. They were at the, there at the beginning in the 1960s. So their brand DNA, and not every brand has this. You saw Benefit had six genes in their DNA that combined into a very special brand essence, if you will. Um, Fusion was a single gene uh, for Hublot, but Bulgari has four, and I've kind of ordered them this way. Bulgari does not do this, but the DNA, they, they actually have it on the website, the agency that did the work for them. Uh, they have the brand film out there as well, so I have a link down there if you want. But it's always, think about, it, well, who's the founder of the brand? It might not be the original, not Soterio or Bulgari in 1884, but it was the three grandsons in the 1960s that really brought the brand to life. So it's them. And they were visionary. They changed what the brand was about. They captured new space. They went international. And they mastered color, which was new to high jewelry at the time. The place and era is undeniably Roman. And that's where they draw their creative ex you know, sort of inspiration from. It's the architecture, the art of the city. And if they go into plants, it's a specific Roman plant, not just any plant, not just any botanical. The shaping clients, very, very different. If you go to most of the other brands, including the British ones, it's all the royalty. Not so Bulgari, it's all the stars. They live on the red carpet, not in a castle. And they remind themselves of this about the brand. And if you pull this all together, it's really about larger than life, being larger than life as a brand. And of course, they put this into a brand book. But they only did so fairly recently, around uh, 2016, when they truly went international. Because if they're in China, Japan, Korea, Nigeria, uh, Argentina, people don't really know what Rome is about. They had to codify this. And it's very, very important they did so. But we often talk about our brand book as being the guardrails of the brand, that can suffocate you as a brand. Um, I tend to think about brand DNA very, very differently. It's your paintbrush. It's the tool, maybe a hammer even, the way you break the category norms. You use the DNA to do something different. You don't do something different and then hope it kind of fits with the brand and try to create, you know, to, to explain that synergy. Um, it's really using the DNA to think differently around the, the DNA, the, the category, and to stand out and to take uh, leadership. And here's Leonardo da Vinci, he says, art lives from constraints and dies from freedom. Right, so the DNA really is a constraint which is an inspiration uh, to bring the brand to life. Everything you do when you disrupt, it shouldn't just be consistent with the brand, it should reflect on the brand and celebrate the brand and bring it to life. And you don't have many opportunities to do so with your clients. You don't have much of their attention. 
Like, I'm just trying to make one point. That's all you can really do with your clients. Many of them, if not most of them, are one-time clients only, if you look at your customer data, if you have access to it. In Bulgari's language, be consistent with your style, but always challenge your creativity and try to innovate by taking unexplored paths. So maybe a bit obvious, but when they do their high jewelry celebration, they don't do it at the Haute Couture fashion show in July in Paris. They did it a month earlier in Capri. And it was, this one year, it was 2018, it was all about movies. And here they sort of replicated that at Selfridges in London. And I just want to give you a sense and a little short movie to show you the feeling they tried to capture and some of the materials they brought out. I think you'll agree with me, it's completely different from any other jeweler. This is a high jewelry event. Some of the pieces are 30, 40,000 euros. But they remind you of the movies. They give you, they, they take certain movies and make a piece for that movie. Another year they did Festa, the Italian way of celebrating. And they again had basically a fashion show which is very unusual for high jewelry. Um, again, different pieces, unexpected, but related to their brand DNA, reinforcing and the brand DNA bring it to life. My troppo, nothing, right, nothing is enough. And when they go into hotels, well, why not just do a whole island in Dubai, not just a hotel? My troppo. Only dead fish swim with the sea. Champagne. They protect champagne, the word, all over the world, but they don't protect kind of the iconography around the brand. So it's not just champagnes. We see here sparkling wine. We see here Prosecco, Cava, Zect. All of them copying, wanting to belong to the category so much that nobody stands out. And even up there, Dom Pignon, which is one of the finest champagnes uh, there is, um, at least on occasion, has followed this. And if all you do is a part of the category, you become dusty, expensive, but dusty. So here is Dom Pignon. This is really the heritage of the brand. This is, it's a cuvee for Muette Chandon, but uh, 1921 is when they first bottled Dom Pignon. It was released in 1936. And what they've really tried to do, they found this book about the treaties of winemaking. One of these compatriots, uh, Brother Peter, wrote this book. Um, and he invented the modern way of making champagne. And it was really about that act of creation. And he was inspired uh, to do so. Um, that became the core of what the brand is about. And of course, um, their client is also important, right? It wasn't the jeweler to the stars, but the client was Louis XIV. Like for many luxury brands, he was the inspiration. Uh, here he is wearing his red lacquered shoes, right? La Boutin, Christian La Boutin was inspired by those red lacquered shoes, and it's really, that, that's the trademarked soul um, he has today. Um, Ian Fleming mentioned Don Prion in his movies. In Dr. No, it's actually used as a, the bottle is used as a weapon. Um, and um, over time, and this is since they've rejuvenated the brand, then they went to these creators. Jeff Koons here with the, with the, with the Venus uh, packaging, which now sells for over $30,000 at auctions. This is the packaging for the, the Dom Perignon bottle. Um, when they do these events with Lang Lang, it's not just having Lang Lang play at a beautiful dinner. He created a piece of music for the dinner. Why? Because that elevates the brand. It reinforces what the brand is about. And it's vintage only. They tend to have a few more vintages than other champagnes, but maybe that's their fine winemaking skills. But it's always different. It's always a new creation, but always Dom Perignon. So there's always that flavor. And that's very, very important for the brand, that you can recognize uh, the flavor of Dom Perignon. And 
Karl Lagerfeld. I had him up before. Here he is with Claudia Schiffer. Um, back in 2008, in a very small way, um, they tried to take this somewhat dusty brand and shake it up. And uh, they came up with this, Carl is a very, or was a very uh, famous photographer as well. And they had this series with Brad um, Kering and, and, and Claudia Schiffer, um, husband and wife. And they were basically photo essay, which was then part of the book, which was called the Unotech back then, which is now called the P2, so that extra long um, aged um, champagne and all these different um, photographs. It's very risque, completely unexpected, uh, but also quite hidden because it was only for the connoisseurs. Okay? So um, I've actually done some work with them um, on their brand DNA, and, and we thought about this. What would this a modern take on this be? And you, you saw this in 2018 when they came up with uh, uh, Lenny Kravitz. He was appointed as the first artistic director of the brand. He's a musician, he's an actor, he's a photographer, and he basically became the creative director for Dom Perignon, and with this line from inspiration uh, to creation, drove the brand. And uh, these are the kind of advertisements uh, Dom Perignon then put out. You will have seen these. I'm sure you will have seen these if you read any kind of luxury magazine, um, even non-luxury magazines. And the story behind them is interesting because like Claudia and all her different sort of guises, she was always Claudia underneath. This is also interesting. It's a different take on the brand. The Grand Cruz that go into Dom Perignon as a liquid, it's like the friends around the dinner table that combine to make this very special occasion. So there's a story, and you can tell the story uh, about the brand and really celebrate the brand. It's very hard to tell a story, I think, around wines and spirits, unless it's about something other than the liquid. That's the starting point. So only dead fish swim with the sea. Here is a different brand. This is more recent, so I've gone to some more recent examples. Um, my wife's an architect, and she works with an interior designer, and she's the customer for all these beautiful wallpapers. They all look the same. It's all about the product. Okay, can we do something different? So Sanderson, which is, um, it's a group, but it also has its own brands, uh, like Morris is one of theirs, um, like from William Morris, 160 years old. It used to be a household name. I don't know if you still know Sanderson wallpaper. Some of you are nodding your heads. Uh, you're probably thinking of your mother's or grandmother's sofa at this point in time. So it's grown a bit dusty as a brand. So Lisa Montague became their CEO. She was the CEO of Lueve before. Uh, she put together a team and they said, let's shake up this brand. Let's wake up this brand. But importantly, we need to do this internally first before we can do this externally as well. So let's bring back the very Sanderson campaign that they had in the 1970s, and let's really bring this brand to life. So it's, the brand is about timeless beauty, about iconish British designs, home and family, sophisticated styles, and very much about botanicals, the English rose. So who is the obvious, obvious brand ambassador? Not Roger Federer, but Mara Etoje. Now, you might say, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you were somewhat surprised, and you're probably saying, what? Um, it's not the English rose on his, on his shirt. Uh, that's the connection to it. But we want you to think about and think a little bit more uh, about the brand. Um, and actually, once you know the story, he is. He is a perfect match. He's also fearless. And he brings back the confidence that the brand has lost over time. So if you go to his Instagram feed, this is years before he did the collaboration uh, with, with Sanderson, but he has his whole feed on who is Maro Itoje, right? Who is he? Um, and he talks about that he's an art lover, and he's very, very cultured, and he's a real family guy, and the brand is around family, and he loves African floral prints because his ancestry came from Nigeria. So actually, he's a perfect, he's a perfect match for the brand. And this is when he announced it, um, that he is a brand ambassador. Here's Sanderson, very Maro Itoje, very Sanderson as a campaign. And it works. Um, at least that's what the early results show. Only dead fish swim with the sea. So this is uh, my final example. This is Porsche. The tagline, I, I wrote it up there a little bit larger for you, all the lust allowed by law. And their formula in car advertising is product a clever slogan, unlike Porsche, 
always in caps, and a brand name. New E, new attitude, Mercedes. Business athlete, BMW. Arrive like never before, Volvo. Student becomes teacher, Maserati. I guess that's my car. Um, it doesn't have an inside voice. Lexus, power, beauty, soul. I don't know, but if you're in the luxury car business, are you buying clever slogans? Again, it's just the product. These are all beautiful, beautiful pieces of technology and craftsmanship. But are they any different? So here's a different kind of ad. It's kind of cute, no? It makes you think a little bit. It makes you pause. It doesn't just say car and you flip the page. Bloody Romans, the straight roads. Why? Because Lotus is a different brand. And it says there, it's for the driver. Lotus is a small brand. They fell in hard times, but they really are coming back. And they said, well, how do we really stand out? We're not about status. We're not about design. We're about the joy of driving. Remember when you had those little sets, uh, these uh, racing car tracks as a kid? That's the joy they, they want to bring back. So at the root of their DNA, Colin Chapman, who's the founder, he was obsessed with light weight. Simplify then add lightness was his, was his line because that makes the car incredibly maneuverable. And of course they won from Le Mans to Formula One. They were an amazing winning brand, and it was all about winning. That's part of it. Their internal company values are win, W-I-N. Um, and you can go to their website and, and look up much more on this as well. And Goodwood, I don't know, one of you I think is here. Tom from Goodwood, are you here? Over there, Tom. So the Goodwood F Festival of Speed, um, they have this magnificent central feature. And every year there's a different car marquee that's selected. But if you look at the last couple of decades, they're all beautiful designs, but they're all very, very similar. They're all very similar, right? There's a car on an amazing sculpture, and then they have lots of events. It's a fabulous um, ev event if you haven't been. This was um, earlier this year in July. This is the largest or the longest cantilevered object ever created. It's about winning. But it's also an engineering feat. It's this very particular engineering design which creates hardness in a very hard structure. And like that advertisement, there is no car. It celebrates lightness. And of course, with COVID, many people are consuming this content online as well. So um, they used augmented reality to bring this to line. And you can see these cars swooshing around. It's like being a child with that little toy set and having that joy of driving uh, when you're at this car show, whether you're there physically or whether you're online at home. Okay? So it gives you a bit of that sense. And I think it's fabulous. It's different, it's on brand, and it's memorable as well. And here is, and I wanted to extend the story a little bit, there's many more nuances to the story, uh, but this is, is Phil uh, Popham, he's the CEO, and he says, we're a sports car brand, the focus of the brand is around the driver and the driving experience. That's what the DNA of Lotus is. However, we believe the brand has the potential to go beyond just sports cars. We'll move into other segments over the course of time. Where should we go? Well, Ferrari went for bicycles. It's, an, it's a beautiful bike. It's expensive. They use the materials from the, from the car in the body, on the tires. But it's a, not an obvious connection, at least not in my book. I really tried to find out. Um, but there is no real obvious connection to the Ferrari brand. It certainly doesn't celebrate and elevate the Ferrari brand. So what does Lotus do? They design a beautiful, lightweight bicycle not for you and me, but to win three golds, three silvers, and one bronze at the Tokyo Olympics. It's all about winning. It's all about lightness and maneuverability. That's what their brand is about. And now, afterwards, they're collaborating to design a commercial bike. So it's a different approach to building and stretching your brand or rejuvenating your brand in this case as well. So coherent disruption. It's always been the watchword of luxury. It signals leadership. Just like Bulgari took a leadership rather than following the Parisian Art Deco designs, uh, they became a leader. It ensures you stay fresh and avoid the dust, and it keeps you ahead of your mastige rivals. And it's a constant challenge. We heard so many different disruptive trends today. The danger is we try to just follow what everybody else is doing. 
whether it's digital transformation, going online, and so forth, use your brand as one of the key ingredients, not just as a guardrail, but as a way to creatively do things differently in this new space. Beware of category norms. Look at what you and your competitors are doing. Put it up on your walls. I think many of you will say, why are we doing this? Are we nose blind? Right? You're just advertising the category. And brief your agency partners accordingly. Be very clear that they celebrate your DNA and they use their creative with that as an input as well. And I think as you've seen, it's not a business for the faint-hearted. You don't always get it right. But unless you take the risk, um, it is very difficult to claim leadership in the category. That's it for me. Thank you.